Marcus Tullius Cicero, uh, 106 to 43. And Cicero is a hero. Cicero is a very great and heroic figure in Western civilization for lots of different reasons. Number one, the actual biography, what he did, and the last few months of his life is one of the great, great heroic moments of, of anybody's life. Um, so there's, there's heroism, there's courage. Um, he was a brilliant lawyer, but more important than anything else, he was a writer on top of being a politician, on top of being an orator. He was a writer. He was a great writer. And he wrote all his life. And fortunately for us, and in one of the most amazing examples of survival uh, of documents, all his letters, well, almost all his letters have survived. Almost all his letters survived. They survived because he planned that they be published. And he had a secretary and a team of copyists who worked with him as he got older, particularly in the last years of his life, 44 and 43, when he understood what was happening. He collected the letters, including letters from his friends. So he would say to them, if you have my letter from a year ago, would you send it back to me because I'm trying to collect my letters? Because he was going to publish the letters. Very quickly, when the full collection of Cicero's letters were available after he died, they became a bestseller. And so thousands of copies circulated uh, during the rest of the Roman story in Latin um, in huge collections, who first uh, in scrolls and then later in, in actual codexes with binding on it. And so by the Dark Ages, by the bad times, 500, 600, 700, when there was a lot of destruction, the number of copies of Cicero's letters was so huge that there was no question of them disappearing. So they've never been out of print since he published them. So they are one of the great books, uh, including Virgil, that have had no interruption in their circulation since they were published. So they've been read now for 2,050 years or 2,040 years uh, without interruption. All through the Middle Ages, everybody who was a lettered person and knew Latin read Cicero. Every single figure, Augustine, Jerome, Ambrose, Gregory, make a list. Every single Roman for the 500s, the 600s, the 700s, even in the dark days of invasions, someone somewhere was still reading the letters of Cicero. In the monasteries, religious monks in the monasteries were reading their copies of Cicero. And then by the uptake in the 1100s, the 1200s, then the copies, of course, exploded, and there were thousands of copies of Cicero. Uh, in the Renaissance, Cicero became the most popular writer. People, everybody in the Renaissance read uh, printed copies because by 1500 now, authoritative, full multi-volume publications of all of Cicero's letters appeared, uh, dual language, Latin and Italian. Soon then they were translated into French, Spanish, English, um, all the languages of Europe, Polish. And so by the year 1600, everybody could read Cicero's letters in their own language. By the 17th century, uh, Cicero is the most popular uh, writer for the generation of Shakespeare. Shakespeare knew all the letters. L L Queen Elizabeth translated them herself as a little fun exercise. She would take the Latin letter and just translate it just for a little fun, you know. And, and then in the 18th century, of course, with the explosion of interest in Rome, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, George Washington, every one of them had their copies of Cicero's letters. Adams carried them with him when he went to London, carried them when he went to Paris. Jefferson did too. Uh, so in the 18th century, everybody read Cicero. And then in the 19th century, it just grew greater and greater and greater, uh, cheaper editions that ordinary people could own. And so by 1900, there was a 1950-year tradition of people reading Cicero's letters. So there's really nobody else like it. There's nobody else in literature like him. There's no accomplishment like this. And the reason, of course, is that Latin never waned. There was never any break in Latin. Latin was always known all the way through and has been up until, it's just now that nobody knows Latin. You know, up till now, it's been fine. So what about letters? Well, you see, the very idea of publishing your own letters, of, of collecting them, 
is a mark of the intense individualism of the Roman moment in history. Do you see what I'm saying? The idea that your collection of letters is, is worth putting together and letting other people read means it's not just ego, but it is the idea that the individual evolution of your life, day to day, week to week, is an interesting subject, you see? So it's an idea of two things, the worth of the individual, the worth of the human dignity of the individual, and history. Now, that's causing a lot of you to click and think, aha, here we have two of the great cultures coming together, don't we? We have the Jews teaching us about the importance of history and the Greeks teaching us about the importance of the individual. That's exactly right. So here in the first century BC, we are now seeing in Rome, within the world of Rome, a new interest in the human individual like never before. Never before. And it will intensify even more because the next step in terms of writing and publishing will be publishing your journal. You see, that's even more intimate, isn't it? Why? Because it's just your personal thoughts, it's your inner thoughts, you're, you're not even writing them to somebody else. How would this have ever occurred to him, the idea of the letters? Well, first of all, you want to remember that Cicero was a born writer. He was a writer by nature. It was in his nature from when he was a kid. He had a brilliant education. He went to Greece, studied Greek, uh, had great uh, tutors. And he was, he was an intellectual. He was a writer. He wrote about all subjects and uh, one... Uh, is a book on the Republic. So he wrote a book about what the Republic should be and how it should work, and uh, in Latin, of course. And when he did it, he, of course, knew Plato had written the famous book in Greek on the Republic from Plato's point of view. He was disagreeing with Plato. He was much more, Cicero was much more a believer in the possibility of a real democratic state. So there's that, there's that book. Then another book that is the most famous book from Cicero, which still is read all over the world, uh, is a book in Latin called De Officis. De Officis, meaning if you see it written, you can see right away the word offices. And so the real translation of the Latin means on our duties as a person, wh what the duties of a human being are, all the things that we do in this world, our family, our civic duties, all these things he summed up in what became uh, probably the single most popular book ever written in Latin. Probably of all the people who wrote books, even more than Virgil, Cicero's book on duties, De Officis, is the single most popular, widely read book uh, in Latin. And never not read, never between his lifetime and now. The book was written in, in 44, so the year of the assassination of Caesar. Why is it so important? Because it establishes a ideal, an ideal for the citizen. And the book says that it is the duty of the citizen, ofikis, duties, it is the duty of the citizen to, in addition to family, to devote himself, some part of himself, to the state, to the body politic. That that's the only way a democratic state can be successful is if individuals all, as a community, equally all participate, vote. That whole discussion of citizenship was an essential point of Cicero's book on duties. And it became a model, it became an ideal, it became the thing that the Western civilization turned back to again and again and again. What he said was that it is the duty of the citizen in a free republic like Rome to participate in the government, to possibly stand for election or help someone get elected, to follow what's happening, uh, to know what's happening in the capital, uh, all those things. He said, it's our duty. And if the state is in stress, if the state is in distress and you live in the state, you must give yourself 
to, to the state and help it through and, and possibly save it from the enemies of the state. So he was setting a very high standard for citizenship in the France of 1940 and 41 and 42, when France was under Nazi occupation, uh, Cicero's book, uh, Deo Ficus, became one of the most precious books for people to own, and, and they passed it from friend to friend to friend, in the mountains, in the hills, in the, all the places that the partisans were living and fighting, the same thing in Italy. And so they be, it became a sort of wonderful inspiration. So Cicero has been an inspiration for 2,000 years. And the book, Deo Ficis, is the best summary of his values.